Welcome back to the Machine Learning at Microsoft YouTube channel. It's another one of those paper review calls. Couldn't keep you away, could I? Welcome back, fellow wizards. Uh, it's a paper review call. Uh, again, it's number 20. We finally reached the magical number 20. And today uh, we've got my good friend Sam Devlin from Microsoft Research in Cambridge. I um, met up with Sam at the ICML conference in LA uh, a couple of months ago and I said, Sam, you know what? You need to do a paper review call because if you don't, I'm going to be very, very upset. And I've cajoled Sam to, uh, to, to do a paper review call and, you know, it's finally happened. So I'm so pleased about that. Um, Sam's been working at Microsoft Research for about a year and a half and he's, he's working on uh, games intelligence. And uh, before that, he was a research fellow and lecturer at the Digital Creativity Labs. He's got a PhD in multi-agent reinforcement learning from the University of York. And he's also got a first class master's degree in software engineering and computer science from the same institution. So um, today, Sam is talking about um, a paper which came out of Microsoft Research uh, called Project Malmo. And as we found out from my friend Tess a couple of weeks ago, uh, Malmo is a city in Sweden and apparently Minecraft came out of Sweden. But um, MSR have released this kind of cross-platform um, environment called Project Malmo and it allows software developers using any language to kind of build these multi-agent systems that can solve these kind of complex and novel and diverse tasks. And it's just kind of like um, a completely open environment for research, not just in reinforcement learning, but any kind of multi-agent system. Um, anyway, it was a fantastic call. We had some really, really good engagement and uh, I really, really appreciate Sam taking the time to, to do this presentation. So um, remember to like, comment and subscribe. And the next call, we have Mihaela Kermai and she is talking about a dimensionality reduction algorithm called um, UMAP. And UMAP is kind of similar to Tisney, but better. In fact, it's incredibly good and it has some really, really interesting computational properties and we're going to go on a deep dive all about uh, topological data analysis and nerve theory and visualization. So um, make sure you, you check us out next week. But in the meantime, I give you Sam Devlin. Project MAMO is an experimentation platform for artificial intelligence research that is built on top of the game Minecraft. The vision of Project MIMO is that it will enable AI technology that can collaborate with humans. In the open world of Minecraft, there are endless possibilities for experimentation. It supports research on a range of approaches, such as reinforcement learning, deep learning, or symbolic AI. So researchers can compare and integrate different approaches to advance AI understanding, reasoning, learning, and communication. So here you can see how to get started. The agent is doing a very simple task, jumping and turning in this flat world. You don't have to be a skilled programmer to get started. Here we use an approach called reinforcement learning, which means that the agent is learning from trial and error about the consequences of its actions. Project MIMO provides all the building blocks for an infinite variety of tasks, starting from the simple ones that we show here, all the way up to the complexity of having agents that learn to communicate using natural language with human players. The virtual environment really lowers the barriers of entry to AI research, and overall it reduces the cost of running experiments. Project MIMO is the platform that we hope will enable the vision that AI agents and humans can solve tasks together. We really hope that Project MIMO will speed up innovation in AI research. You can try it today, it's available on GitHub. So what made you join Microsoft? Uh, so in particular, the paper that I'm going to review today was a large part of it. Um, so in this paper, the, the authors proposed Minecraft as a platform for experimenting with AI. And the, um, the sort of ambition there of the, the scale of the game, the complexity of uh, the AI that can be created within this game, um, and the opportunity then within Microsoft to explore that as part of my research direction and to have the potential for impact to have 
uh, the potential to have impact on billions of players worldwide, which I think is very unique at Microsoft from having this sort of balance both between having an entire gaming org with the Xbox platform and all of the Microsoft Game Studios, whilst also having a world-class research arm in MSR. Fantastic. And, and this Malmo platform, it's all about, you know, allowing people to create these multi-agent systems that can do tasks and solve challenges that are that are really quite, you know, diverse and complex. Um, d- does it imply that it's a reinforcement learning uh, problem or could it be something else? Not at all. And, and, and in the, the talk, I will uh, touch slightly on the fact that Minecraft is also being used for uh, research into procedural content generation, um, into game analytics on how players are acting in the world and so forth. Um, it's also uh, quite a personal uh, view in that uh, agents who are acting in these environments are trying to solve sequential decision-making problems. At the moment, reinforcement learning pr- pr- is providing great results, but it may not ultimately be the framework that's needed to, to really reach the potential of sequential decision-making, autonomous agents in games as vast and as complex as Minecraft. Sure, that makes sense. And and just from a kind of practical advice point of view, so we're, we're talking about the gaming world, but imagine if we could kind of solve this problem in the gaming world so we could come up with an algorithm that could, you know, allow these um, agents in these complex and novel and diverse environments to solve all these different problems. Um, what then? You know, Could we use that in the real world? So there's a lot of ongoing research about how to do that sort of transfer. Um, so there, there's complexities in the this differences between simulators to real world. Um, there's there's challenges on that transition, um, and there's large communities that explore it. Um, in particular, I'm very intrigued by the uh, conference on robotics learning that are, are really sort of pushing the machine learning angle for robotics and real world applications. Uh, personally, we're, we're really motivated by the actual use case in video games. We see that as, as a real world opportunity, given the numbers of players and the, the size of the industry. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely potential for that transfer in the long term. Awesome. And who's your biggest inspiration in the research world? <laughs> hmm. Put you on the spot there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's so many different angles, really. Um, so there's absolute pioneers on the reinforcement learning side, um, people like Rich Sutton um, that have been stuck to this sort of trajectory. Um, and even when the, the field wasn't as popular as it is now, but really pioneered and pushed forward on that that, that angle. Um, but then there's also pe- some of the big names on the gaming side. Uh, so people like Julian Tegelius at NYU really stands out for advocating for this case that video games in themselves are a use case, right? They are the real world and they are uh, a, a, not an end to a means to like something that AI researchers should just use to try and pursue AI, but actually a really worthwhile cause in themselves. That's interesting. Yeah. And when, when you mentioned um, uh, Sutton, of course, there was a whole um, world in reinforcement learning before Q learning and before deep reinforcement learning. You know, people don't realize it's been going on. For, it's got this huge lineage going back decades. Yeah. And I, I will try and touch on that a little bit in the talk, because um, I, I, I remember when uh, all, so the DQN result was like towards the end of my PhD. Um, and it was, you know, it's been fascinating to see how this space has transformed over the last five, six years. Um, but yeah, there's a huge history there. And one of the things that I think is really interesting at the moment in the deep reinforcement learning community is you're seeing uh, this sort of same diversification of uh, now that the sort of gold rush has happened as far as applying deep learning to single agent reinforcement learning, you start to see the community split into some of the specializations that they were there before the deep learning era, like multi-agent learning. Um, but now we're starting to see that split again and seeing how does that uniquely combine with deep learning to again scale up these results for these different tasks such as multi-agent learning. Indeed, brilliant. Well, anyway, Sam, thank you so much for the intro and uh, I'm looking forward to the cool tasks and you have an environment and you can programmatically kind of build um, on this, uh, uh, you, you know, um, in any language uh, of your choosing. Anyway, without any further ado, um, good luck, Sam. Over to you.
Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, so yeah, as Tim said, I'm Sam Devlin. I'm a researcher here at MSR Cambridge, um, working in the game intelligence theme, uh, particularly on Project Malmo. Um, I've chosen this for the, the paper review, both because uh, it's something that I'm actively working on, uh, but it's also a paper that had a lot of personal meaning in, in my journey to, to researching machine learning at Microsoft in that it led me to reach out and, and make that connection that ultimately led me to join in the team. Um, so with that said, I will just share screen and get started. Is that working, Tim? Working beautifully. Nice, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about Project Malmo, which is uh, an open source platform for using Minecraft for AI research. Um, as a little bit of context, there's been a lot of great work, particularly over recently around using classic video games as a platform for developing AI. I know on one of these previous uh, on paper reviews on this channel, you, you did a dive on DQN, uh, the nature paper there on the left. Um, but Last year, late last year, um, Uber beat the last two like outstanding challenges in this game, uh, Montezuma's Revenge and Pitfall, and they got superhuman performance in these for the first time. Um, so, kind of leads to the question of like, what's next? What's the next game to to explore? And and one of the things that uh, really motivates me is that maybe this could be something about rather than just beating or replacing human players, maybe we don't need to just have superhuman performance in a game. Maybe a more fun and enjoyable experience would be about agents that work with us to do things together in games. Um, and so you start to think uh, moving forwards within games beyond some of these sort of early games where it was single player and getting towards a, a score or an ending. Uh, and that's where uh, Minecraft comes in as a really good platform for this. Uh, so for anybody not familiar with Minecraft, um, I often like to compare it to sort of an infinite Lego set. Um, and uh, the big change here is that this is an open-ended game. There's no way that you can win at Minecraft. People make up their own games within it. Um, people will play different things out in there. but. It's uh, an, an environment where you can explore, you can create, and you can socialize with other players. If you want to create your own games within that space, then people are free to do that, and they do quite often. Um, but it's an open-ended, uh, very exploratory space rather than a very limited game that's defined with specific rules and rewards. Um, it also has a more natural interface for humans and AIs to interact together. Um, so the, the, a lot of the Atari games that have been studied previously, they're single player, whereas Minecraft was always designed for multiple people to be in the same environment acting together. And so it gives this sort of flexibility to, to both study agent to agent interactions, but also human to agent interactions. Right? So we have a nice safe space where we can explore this and, and see what would actually happen when humans interact with these agents do they want to interact with a superhuman AI that's going to just beat them? Or do they want to interact with AIs that are going to help them to achieve more? Um, and one of the other angles here is that the, there's a procedural content generation already within the game. Um, and there's a whole research line there that can be explored. Um, and there's a lot of user generated content. And so uh, issues that have been coming up recently within the deep reinforcement learning community around generalization can really be challenged here. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in the talk. Um, but the main thing being that there isn't just like one instance of this world that you can just solve and, uh, and overfit to. You have to learn policies that can generalize to different environments, to people changing the entire structure of the world around the agent. So, as I said, there's this whole other angle on procedural content generation in Minecraft that's an interesting AI problem in itself and a good opportunity space for machine learning. Um, it's not what I'm going to focus on, but I did just want to signpost to this other competition that's running in this space. So this is a competition run uh, by the academic community for looking at can you generate settlements like entire towns and villages. Uh, they ran this last year already and there were some great results, but they're going to be announcing very soon the, the latest results. So if you're interested in like uh, content generation and generative models, then this is a good one to check out. 
Instead, the thing that I'm going to focus on and, and the focus for Malmo is around autonomous game playing agents, right? So this is the case where you have an agent that's embodied in an environment um, and they are observing, they're getting some observation of this environment from which they have to choose actions to take and they may get some reward from the environment that signals how well they've done or how badly they've done. Um, there's multiple ways to, to tackle this. Uh, some of the, the ways that we focus on as a team are based around imitation learning. So this is uh, quite often based off of supervised learning, for instance. Just If you've got a data set of how humans play the game, maybe you can just take those states uh, and map them directly to actions in a similar way as you would for other supervised learning problems. Um, and there's lots of extensions built off of that that we can talk about. Um, and the, the other angle being reinforcement learning where there is no provided data set, a labeled data set. Uh, instead, you've just got to learn to maximize these rewards over time. Um, and these are some of the popular ways in the moment. Um, you could also look at this as a planning problem, or some people would like to explore evolutionary algorithms from this, depending on what research community you're from or what assumptions you bring to it. But I'm going to mostly frame this in reinforcement learning terms, but the platform is flexible to that. Right? If you have anything that is appropriate for a sequential decision-making task, then this platform can, can accommodate that. And so the paper itself uh, was presented at Ichikai in 2016, alongside an open source release of the entire platform for experimentation. Um, so this is a Microsoft paper from Microsoft Cambridge. Um, I wasn't with the team at the time, but as I said at the start of the call, like for me, this was really sort of eye-opening that this was a direction that Microsoft were taking and were supporting here. Um, so all of the exciting possibilities that I saw coming from it, really, this that's what attracted me here to this team. Um, so yeah, there's a link there to, to the GitHub repo. This is all open source, it's still being updated. Um, it's worth checking out if people want to try out any of the things they see here. Um, so a few things about the platform. Uh, this predominantly is there to connect agents, AI agents into the game. Uh, it uses OpenAI Gym as the interface. So if people are familiar with that, it's a very common interface. So any pretty much most modern reinforcement learning open source implementations you'll find online will support this. And so they'll easily be able to plug into the uh, into Malmo as the environment. Um, we also provide tools for task creation, which I'll go over a little bit in a moment. Um, and it's entirely open source for people to extend and make novel uses of. So the the platform exposes various types of observations um, and actions and reward handlers that are already in place. But if people want to introduce new rewards or new observations that we haven't thought of, um, they have full access to do that with it. Um, it's also cross-language and cross-platform. Again, just trying to be uh, as flexible as they, we could be with it and lowering that barrier to entry. Um, so to, to just talk through uh, one example of, of using this and do a little sort of hello Malmo world. So after you've pip installed Malmo, you need to define a task. So for this, I'm going to use the uh, cliff walking example on the, the bottom left. So People familiar with the reinforcement learning textbook by Sutton and Barto might recognize this. The agent's got to walk to the end um, of this sort of cliff with lava either side so they can easily fall off and have to reset the episode. So to find this in Malmo, um, we start off with just a flat world generator. So we can have any pre-existing Minecraft world within can add some elements to that world. So we can either just use the world as it was generated or we can add elements in. So this is a way of sort of constructing the world around without having to go into the game client and do it. You then define the state and action space. So uh, if you recall from the uh, agent slide previously, these agents need to receive some form of state and be able to choose an action. Um, and so this defines which states and actions they, they can take. Um, and this is also like there's lots of options for this within the platform for defining different states and actions and then defining a reward structure that the agent's going to receive from that. Then once you've got your XML um, script in place for the particular environment, uh, the the, we then create the agent. In this case, I've uh, used an old Python example, um, slightly dated because it says import Marlow at the top. Uh, that'll be Mineral or Malmo now, um, but 
the instructions at the end will point to the relevant resources on that. Um, but again, for those familiar with OpenAI Gym, we see common thing place of making an instance of the gym, um, resetting the environment, and then going into this loop where we, we render the environment, uh, we sample an action from our action space, and then make that step on the environment with it, receiving back the observations and rewards and some extra information and a done flag. Um, this agent would just be random. It's just randomly sampling from the action space. Um, but it just just given here is a, a sort of simple case to show how how uh, basic these examples can get. Um, and then if we just run this agent, um, cheat it slightly. I've got a trained agent here now, uh, a DQN agent uh, that you went over in the previous call. Um, I, I'm presuming everybody can imagine what the random agent would do. Uh, so th this agent's been trained. We see it moving through the space and collecting the 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 um, item at the end of the walkway there safely without falling off. Uh, we also have a visualization on the left-hand side, which <coughs> visualizes the two values for the agent. Uh, with green being higher reward and red being lower reward in space. Um, I, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to dive into DQN because I know it was covered on a previous call. Uh, but for anybody that's on the call that really wants to code up their own DQN agent. Hold on. Yeah, turn down the volume. <laughs> I've, I've just muted uh, Sheldon. Sorry about that. Sam, um, Sam <laughs> now might be a good time to ask a question. Yep. Um, it, right. So I, I was just looking at that XML code, and it seemed it seemed to be kind of defining a reward structure where if you go into the lava, it's minus 100 points, and if you yep. go on a block, it's plus 100 points. And I, I understand some of the problems of reinforcement learning is is um, you you could learn kind of um, uh, things that you shouldn't learn. So for example, it might learn to go around in circles on all of the blocks instead of you know, finding the the goal at the end, which is what you want it to learn. So, um, could could you talk through that? Yeah. So it depends on the the case of the environment. So um, this so th this can happen if you if you have different convergence guarantees. If we're on DQN, we we essentially have none. Um, particularly as there's going to be some partial observability here due to the screen. Um, in this case, it wasn't an issue because it's a small enough world. Um, but that reward design does become very important when you scale up uh, the complexity of these worlds. And again, this this sort of sparse reward issue, well, so the sparse reward issue is exactly why Montezuma's Revenge stood out for so long um, and, and pitfall because the rewards there are both very sparse and also deceptive um, because you get this, there's quite a lot of penalties in the space and then the agent can learn to avoid the penalties and then never explore and find find the actual reward. Um, so there's various challenges to this um, and different ways to work around it. Um, in this case, it's small enough that it's not an issue, uh, but designing a reward function is a whole, whole topic. And just to be clear, by sparse, is that the same as saying delayed? So sometimes you might have to take several actions before you understand what the reward is. No, so, so delayed isn't so much an issue. Um, so in this case, the, the reward is delayed because the reward is only when it gets to the item at the end on the blue square. Um, so that will get um, propagated back through the states, which um, if this was a learning video, you'd see it. But you see this credit assignment essentially where it's bright green in the top left on the, the if you look at the grid on the left hand side, it's very bright green where the actual reward is. And then it's getting less and less green as it comes back from it, right? So we use a discount factor uh, so to get this so that we propagate that value back towards the start state. Um, but sparse means that sparsity of rewards depends on um, more just how infrequent it is. Uh, and because this is a small enough little world, um, it's not too sparse a reward to, to learn it in a good amount of time. Um, but with uh, with some of these sort of extreme cases, you could go multiple screens, uh, multiple screens, uh, thousands of times, thousands of steps in the right way till you hit anything of a reward. There's no sort of, there's nothing then to get a gradient off of before you've hit it. I see. Yeah. So yeah, for, for anybody that wants to uh, implement VQN in, in Minecraft themselves, I, I've put a link here to uh, 
a, a tutorial that one of my colleagues, Katya, who's the research lead on Project Malmo, she ran this uh, about two weeks back in London at the Machine Learning Summer School. Uh, the link will take you to the full repo with lots of tutorials on machine learning. It's a great resource and something I definitely recommend broadly. Uh, but this tutorial in particular will take you through all the steps to getting set up with Malmo and writing your own DQN agent and training it. So they'll really combine the uh, the previous call on this channel on the, the DQN paper with, with the Malmo one and take you through all the steps to get up and running and training an agent like this yourself. Um, so one, once this platform was in place, the team here then started to utilize this with their, their own research within the team. Um, so this first paper touches partly on one of the things I mentioned at the beginning about generalization. So uh, running through one fixed maze to find an exit, like running through that, that cliff to find the, the, the item at the end, that's an easy enough task because it can just memorize a particular route through. But if the visuals change and you're, you're running just off of pixels on the screen, it could, if it's uh, typically a deep RL solution, wouldn't then generalize. Um, so this, <clears throat> this paper looked at how do you generalize to changes in the visualization, changes to the layout in the maze uh, very quickly. And so this was a, a sort of core AI contribution from the team. <clears throat> but we also used it internally for um, more broadly looking at uh, the app Im implications of putting these sorts of agents into games. And so uh, here's another example, which was from Kai a few years back, um, again, before I joined the team. But this was looking at um, presuming we did have these agents that could just act autonomously within Minecraft. How would people want to interact with those agents? And so for this, they did a, a study within the lab of um, they had a, a group of teenage participants interact with agents via natural language or just acting in the space. And they did a qualitative study of how the how the, the participants interacted with what they believed was an AGI in the gaming space. Um, in reality, it was a Wizard of Oz study where there was a person remotely controlling the AGI, um, but it was a, a way of doing that sort of design experimentation of exploring what are the ways that people want to interact with these agents, what are the ways that they expect them to respond. Um, and again, you see these differences in the way that people expect to be able to, to interact with agents, which differs significantly from how people expect to interact with other people, for example. Uh, and again, this was a really sort of... Uh, uh, a motivator for me in, in making this transition in that this isn't something that you see within the core AI community a lot, um, but as this technology transfers into more real world use cases, how people want to interact with autonomous agents, it's a really important topic, right? We don't necessarily just want AIs that beat us at everything or AIs that solve every problem for us. We want AIs that are going to work together with us and try and achieve something together. So those two I, I, I chose just as a quick example of the um, sort of ongoing machine learning research and, and broader research uh, at Microsoft that utilized Malmo. Um, but I also wanted to touch a little bit on some of the community outreach that's then sort of happened as well from it. Uh, in particular, this, this stands out as a course run at the University of California, Irvine. Um, so everything you see on the screen are environments that um, students at the university have made um, and then trained agents for using Project Malmo. So uh, the, the coursework on this, this uh, is literally to both design an environment and, and train agents to do it. And if you check out um, Samir's website, you'll see pages and pages of these, of all the different sorts of things that people have created. You can download them all. Uh, again, it's all open source and out there. There's usually lectures, like uh, talks that they've given as well about the particular problems that they've, they've created within Minecraft and tried to train agents for. Um, and again, it's just a really good example of saying, showing the richness of the environments that can be created within Minecraft. Sam, have you created any agents or, or do you have any favorite examples here that you could kind of just abstractly talk through? Um, yeah, actually, that leads naturally into the next line of uh, uh, of the talk anyway. So nice. um, when, I, when I joined the team, I brought my sort of bias, which was uh, multi-agent learning. Um, it was already a sort of topic and it was where we had common interest already com coming through. Um, but one of the first things I did was look at sort of multi-agent environments that are within Minecraft 
um, and worked with a team here to start designing some some sort of multi-agent experiences within this. So the cliff walking and, and things we've seen so far with single agent experiments again. Um, but it's very natural in Minecraft for people to play games together uh, or to compete against each other in different types of games. And so um, we, we start to hit on some of the, other, if, if we were to put agents into this space, we start to hit on some of the core challenges in multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, and one of the things we were talking to him just before the call um, was about the fact that there's this trend at the moment I'm noticing in the, the deep reinforcement learning community um, where the sort of gold rush for initial papers in this single agent space has happened. And now the, the community seems to be specializing in the same ways it did before DQN, right? Where there were all these different specialties within reinforcement learning. It's a, it's a huge, huge topic. Um, my particular focuses on multi-agent learning and there's another huge community that's been in that space for a long time, predating DQN and things like that. And now that we see the deep RL community starting to specialize, you start to see these really interesting papers cropping up around what can happen at this intersection between, for example, the multi-agent learning community and the deep learning community and what does this new tool set provide us within that context of multi-agent learning. So just to um, talk a little bit about the extra challenges the multi-agent brings. Um, if we have our environment and we've got our agent acting in it, you've got your DQN agent that you've trained and, uh, and we've covered from the previous call. Um, the most naive approach if we want to like just train multiple agents is we just drop them all in the environment and train them separately. Now, if you do this, you hit an issue of uh, non-stationarity. So when an agent's acting in the environment, it's just assuming essentially all the other agents are within the environment. And so when it takes a state, when it's in a state and it takes an action, the reward it receives may change. And that's not due to stochasticity in the reward function, but it's because one of the other agents has changed their policy. And so decoupling what is stochasticity in the environment versus what's happened because other agents learning is a very challenging problem. Um, uh, just as a, a simple one to, to link it back to um, what people might know on DQN, you have this experience replay where you're storing state action and reward tuples that you're, you're learning your value function off of. If, that's, if all of that experience is from the past and the other agents in the environment have changed their policy, then those pairs of states, actions, rewards are no longer relevant, right? So taking that action in that state wouldn't receive the same reward now. Um, and so there's been a lot of work. And again, this is where you start to see these interesting papers at the intersection of deep learning and multi-agent learning emerge, which try to overcome some of these issues. Um, an alternative approach is that we just group all the agents together as one. And we do what, what's often referred to as a joint action learner. So we just got one centralized controller that's controlling all of the agents. Um, it's taking in all of the joint states and taking a joint action. This suffers from the curse of dimensionality because every time you add another agent to your, your centralized controller, you get an exponential increase in the state and action space. Right. So this can work if you've got a small number of agents with a small action spaces. But if you're in something like Minecraft, then uh, it's not going to scale up. So one of one of the um, one of the more novel ways of doing this that um, is this concept of centralized critic. And so in this framework, you have everybody's acting independently off of their policy but they share a centralized critic, which is learning a value function off of the joint state that it's received from all the agents. If we make that a, a joint V rather than a joint Q, then it no longer grows exponentially, it just grows linearly in the number of agents. And that's usually enough of a signal to correlate the different agents who are all acting independently, just receiving their local state, taking their local action. Um, this also enables many forms of sort of multi-agent cre credit assignment because of having this joint element at training time. Um, and it's, um, again, it's, it, it's an assumption that we feel is a workable one. Um, others prefer to do this sort of independence. And again, then you have this sort of big open area about how do you coordinate if you're doing everything independently and do not allow any centralized form. So for people interested in those sorts of issues, um, there's two survey papers I know here. Um, one pre-deep learning, um, which would go over, which was 
goes over a lot of the history of the sort of multi-agent reinforcement learning community uh, and one much more recent. In fact, there's a, a 2019 update to this, which is fairly exhaustive coverage of what's been done within the deep RL community for multi-agent. Both, re I recommend both of them. They're, together, they really give you a good coverage of this space. Can I ask a clarifying question there? Yep. Have, have you worked with uh, heterogeneous agents? In other words, like at ICML.cc, there was um, uh, talking about agents that have causal influence over other agents' actions, like influencers. And so yep. basically setting up um, different agents with different reward structures. And you support you support that, I assume. Yeah, you can absolutely program. do it within the framework. Um, it brings in all sorts of other challenges with training, um, but uh, within the centralized critic paradigm, so there, there's a paper from Neurips 2017. Um, it's from the OpenAI team with this, uh, I can't remember the name, the exact, the exact name of the paper, but the algorithm was uh, MADDPG, and this had a centralized critic per agent. And then that way you can have different value functions for every one of the agents, which would result from having these different reward functions. And the the particular paper that you're talking about, though, really nicely fits in with uh, some of the stuff on credit assignment. Um, so it, it's closely related to a concept called empowerment, um, which was right. something that we looked at quite actively as to, um, again, because it provides novel gameplay experiences, right? Maybe the best thing for an agent in a multi-agent scenario when it's with a human isn't to win the game, but maybe it's to be that influencer agent that you see in that paper um, and sort of give the player clues as to what to do. And then you get into all sorts of things about sort of grounded language learning and how can agents communicate with humans rather than agents communicating with other agents. It's Absolutely. a great paper. Uh, it, it's a really good paper. Um, Natasha's talk on it, I believe, is online. So if people haven't seen it, I definitely recommend checking that out as well. Okay, so given this sort of uh, this sort of space of problems, uh, last year we ran this competition on multi-agent reinforcement learning in Minecraft. Um, there's a paper up on archive that explains the problems, and there's uh, a starter kit, and all the tasks are all open source again on GitHub. Uh, this was a collaboration from between Microsoft with Crowd AI that provided the platform for online um, evaluation of, of people that were submitting agents. Uh, with Queen Mary University, particularly Reluca and Diego, Reluca implemented a lot of the environments, uh, and Daniel Ionita, who was one of the software engineers at, at Queen Mary at the time, that helped out a lot with the platform again for evaluation. Uh, and then EPFL, which is where Mahanti was, who was also sort of split between Crowd AI and EPFL. Um, so a large collaboration both between Microsoft and the academic community to pursue this. Um, and in particular, we defined three tasks. Um, the first mob chase is based off of something that's very common in the multi-agent literature um, of this scenario where you've got a couple of agents in a space and they've got to capture, uh, in this case, in the picture in the top middle, a pig. Um, so they have to get either side of the pig, they need to coordinate to, to corner it, uh, and they get a big reward. Alternatively, the agents can opt out and go to one of the purple spaces that are placed around the outside of the space for a small reward. So if they're in there with an agent that they don't think is collaborating very well, maybe it's better to take opt out and take the small reward. One of the other things that we did in this uh, competition was again to make sure that we were testing the generalization of um, the solutions people were submitting. So it wasn't just to, to capture this pig in this environment. You see on the top right, some different variations where some of the colorings changed because the weather conditions have changed or that the uh, mob that they're trying to capture has changed. So uh, it's changed with to chickens and cows and some of the examples there. Uh, so that was a, a fully collaborative um, and symmetric game where both players have the same sort of uh, state and action space. In the bottom left, we introduced something where they have heterogeneous roles. Uh, so this was the treasure hunt game. Um, in this, one agent can collect treasure but can't defend itself. And then the other agent can defend against the skeleton that's in the space, uh, but it can't collect the treasure. So the two agents need to work together to utilize the, 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 the two agents have to learn to utilize the different skill sets that they have and abilities to successfully complete this and collect the treasure and get a joint reward. 
And then the final most challenging one uh, was a build battle. So this is a game that, that people play in Minecraft themselves. Uh, and it's, it's a race where you see a structure in one space uh, and then you have to build it in another space. Uh, so in this case, they would see uh, the yellow and blue block at one end and then they need to go and recreate that at the other end of the room. Uh, so we ran this competition throughout most of the last year. Um, it did close. The, like I said, the tasks are all open source, so they're still there if people want to try things out. Um, our winners were this team from Germany, who didn't actually use a predominantly reinforcement learning method. They actually used something that was more closely uh, an imitation learning method, so it's, uh, similar to a supervised approach given data that they recorded of themselves performing the tasks. Um, and we also had a number of uh, entries from uh, all around the world, so participants from New York, China and Tokyo that all did very well in the competition. Um, these are all great participants, but these problems are far from solved. And in particular, I wanted to sort of just touch on one really big open challenge, both that we observed in this, uh, but that's also been put very nicely in recent work um, on Hanabi. Um, so this was a paper that came out early this year on Archive. Um, and so they worded this particularly nicely that the ultimate goal, what we really want is to have these agents interact with humans, right? So in the previous example, all of those agents were trained with other agents and they played with other agents. Um, but if we drop a human in the, that loop, then they don't necessarily play in the same way that agents would play. Um, so to do this, we can evaluate um, a whole range of different teammates. Uh, against uh, the one necessarily trained against each other uh, and play them off against the other agents. Um, this paper also introduced this sort of idea around maybe one way of making this a simpler challenge is that you could observe 10 games of the, the person you're about to play with prior to playing so you can start to infer their style and the way they play. Um, and, and in particular, one of the things they did in this paper is this evaluation. So. Uh, what we have here is uh, on the left is for two player Hanabi, on the right is for four player Hanabi. Um, every column and every row represents a different agent. Um, and the, so the diagonal is when the agents are played with the other agent that they were trained with, another instance of themselves. And there you see that the scores of the agents are very high along the diagonal. But then as soon as they're paired with an agent that wasn't an instance of themselves, even in some cases where the agent is the same agent, same hyperparameters, same learning algorithm, but trained with a different random seed. We see that they can't play together very well. And it's all this dark blue area. And then the final column on both sides is the average. And on average, they play very badly if they're having to play with a whole range of, of, of different um, partners. This was actually exactly something we saw in the Marlowe competition as well. Um, so all, all the entrants that were put into the competition play very well when they're paired with another instance of themselves. When they're paired with an, uh, an instance of an agent they haven't seen previously, they don't play as well. And of course, we can't expect humans to train with the AIs, uh, particularly with the sample inefficiencies that are currently in place. Um, so we need to be able to have this sort of fast online ad adaptation to players um, so that we can not just play well with other agents. Um, there was also another nice paper at ICML uh, in one of the workshops that, that studied this in Overcooked. And they showed that when you train um, two PPO agents together, then the agents worked out what they figure is the optimal way of playing the, the level. Uh, and then when they put humans in, in the mix with that PPO agent, PPO agent is like, no, I, I know the way to go. You've got to go this way. And they wouldn't adapt or change to the human. Uh, the way they got around it was to then do imitation learning on the humans uh, and have the PPO agent train with the imitation learn agent. And then when they put that agent back in with the humans, they see it's more adaptive. Uh, it can play in different styles um, to accommodate how the humans play. And again, we this sort of keep coming back to this theme of data sets and, and having gameplay data, and that's motivating uh, one last thing I want to touch on today which is uh, this ongoing competition this year is looking around this idea of um, can we use the gameplay data to make deep reinforcement learning more sample efficient? 
Um, so can we utilize the fact that there's lots of data out there that's collectible via Malmo on how humans play the game and use that to make these agents capable of doing achieving more? Um, I'm just going to play a short video, which will allow me to grab some water and uh, introduce the competition. So for this competition, the, the aim is to obtain a diamond, uh, but the data set is captured, is broken down into these different sub goals. And again, there's multiple examples of people um, performing these sub goals, like chopping down trees, obtaining the bed, obtaining meat, obtaining the iron pickaxe, they're all necessary to doing it. Um, and so there's a sort of open research question around, can we exploit the, the structure within these tasks? Um, that's demonstrated across all these different variations, both in the variations in how humans play the game, but also the variations like the different lighting conditions or the different biomes that they might be in. You see this particularly in the top uh, with the Navigate example, where it's in uh, a foresty situation on the left, and then in the, the center, it's in this snowy region, but the underlying task is essentially the same. Can we extract what that the, the underlying structure is so that we can more efficiently learn how to act when put into a new instance of this task? So this is an active competition that's ongoing at the moment. Um, it's all open source. The data set's been released um, and it will be running um, until September for this first round. But then the main competition is in uh, New Europe at the end of the year. Um, so it's still a good time to enter. Um, I think there's conditions on Microsoft employees not, not being able to win prizes, but we still encourage everybody to take part and, uh, and contribute their, their ideas in this space. And it's a good way to get started on, uh, on Malmo and, and trying out something that's really a, a large open research question in how to, tackle, how to tackle this task and also how to utilize that gameplay data. Uh, that's everything I had for the day. It's just a few details here on uh, resources I recommend if people want to follow up about uh, Project Malmo. So um, we're following the Twitter account for up-to-date information. Everything should be on the project website um, and the final link there for the current ongoing competition. Um, and that's that's all I had prepped. Sam, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, let's open the floor to questions. I mean, I'll, I'll kick off if, if people are going to be uh, nervous to ask one. Um, in the supervised world, we do multitask learning as well. It's something that we're starting to see. Uh, from, Microsoft released a paper uh, called MTDNN in the natural language processing world. And of course, it has a kind of regularizing effect. And we have this generalization crisis in deep learning. And, you know, learning across multiple tasks seems to help. Um, you know, how would you describe that in, in a reinforcement learning context? So, so we hit some of the same, same sort of issues, right? That um, if we're not training over multiple tasks, then we overfit, right? And and this is this is something that's been highlighted a lot recently. Um, I'm trying to think, there's some, some particularly good papers. There's one out of uh, NYU lab um, that was on archive late last year, um, which looked at the fact that procedural content generation helps. Um, generalization of reinforcement learning policies. Um, they used the GBG AI platform and they generated lots of instances, trained agents on it, and they showed it generalizes better. One of the challenges there is that it, it trains better on um, other generated levels, but not necessarily on human design levels, right? So if your generator is, if your generator of environments is essentially from a different distribution to how humans design levels, then you again overfit to that distribution. Um, 
I mean, is, is this overfitting thing a serious issue? Because um, on the warm up to the call, I asked the question that even if we do solve this, so, you know, with Malmo allows you to create these kind of novel, complex, diverse environments where you have to solve multiple tasks and do all sorts of different things. And even if that were solvable, what could you do with that? You know, would, would it would it generalize to a new environment or the real world? Um, directly from Malmo, unlikely, um, just because there's certain structure in. Uh, so one of the things that we're utilizing for that sort of mineral competition is that there is structure and there is a repeated pattern, but it's not the same as the sort of patterns and the physics that you have in a real world environment. Uh, one of the things I think is really interesting at the moment, you see the, like uh, Minecraft Earth and with this AR experience of overlaying Minecraft on real world. And so through those sort of augmented reality experiences, maybe we can go one step further as to, again, experiencing, having agents experience more of the real distribution of environments that are in the real world, um, which, again, a Minecraft world isn't in that sort of space. Um, it provides us lots of challenges that would transfer like how to interact with humans, how to, if, if you've got these sort of limited uh, communication channels, how to utilize that. But the movement in that space is on a particular physics and it, it will overfit to that sort of physics, at least current methods, right? Which again, sort of starts to hit on that, that question of like, we don't want to just interpolate between what we've seen within the distribution. How do we get out of distribution generalization? I have a question about the action space. Yep. Uh, so um, I noticed some of the examples there uh, didn't go into too much detail about the crafting mechanism in Minecraft. And it seems like the crafting mechanism would explode the action space. So can you talk about that? Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it depends how you augment the game, right? So this is something we hit on a lot. Um, one of the one of the common ways that we can at least make that constant action space is we take the same action space that the user has, right? So if we, if we work on what a, uh, humans have a controller, right, and the controller has uh, a fixed length of uh, inputs that you can give. So by utilizing that, then we don't have to give different actions for everything that's within the crafting tree. It still makes it a very challenging problem because the uh, the horizon of the planning uh, within the crafting tree is a big thing. And, and again, that's partly what this mineral challenge is trying to address by looking at if you've got some idea of the structure of the what, of a particular route through, through the crafting tree, um, how do you pursue that? Um, but yeah, that, that's also where it's a wide open sort of space, like having an agent just naturally explore that crafting tree and discover the things that it can make is an interesting challenge. Yeah, the, the only way that I've ever built uh, something where future actions open up is to pre-slot them basically, is to create the entire action space at the start and then you know enable things as they become. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know about yeah. the different techniques people use uh, to, to solve that. So you mean like the, the action space is dynamically changing? Yes. So you're, you're accommodating for it by blocking. Yeah. Um, the, so nothing immediately comes to mind, but the the community I'd look at, there's a run of competitions on text adventure games. Um, and there the action space is any, any natural string of text. Um, and so that's something that I, I would look to that community for, for things as to um, techniques that they've utilized for that. Because again, you've got this sort of variable length action input that you can put in. Um, you've got essentially an infinite action space because it's uh, all natural language that you can place in. Um, and there's a, a survey out from Shimon Whiteson's group at Oxford uh, that's at Ichikai this year that touches on these sort of uses of reinforcement learning in natural language which again, we'll, we'll cover sort of those uh, methods that have been used to handle that natural language action space. Thank you. Let's go. Uh, you muted, Tim. Sorry about that. I was just talking to myself. Um, I was reading through the paper, and um, yeah. what I what I found was really interesting was this kind of section too. I don't know if you can talk through it, but it, it talks about you know the Melma platform is designed to support a wide range of experimentation needs and can support research in all these different disciplines. It provides a rich, structured, and dynamic environment to which agents, coupled through a natural sensory motor loop, more generally, we believe that implements the characteristics of the AGI environments, tasks, and agents. And it goes on to describe seven concepts that that you would expect. To have in, in such a, an environment. Could you kind of like roughly talk through them? Yeah, absolutely. And so, so this was something that um, 
I'll try to touch on briefly on a summarizing slide at the beginning. The but this was one particular breakdown of this. Um, so the the different conditions uh, I believe were taken straight from the the um, the paper that's cited there at the beginning. Um, and so we see that the the range task is complex because of the things like this how to obtain a diamond. Um, but it's also very diverse compared to uh, the sort of multi agent tasks of uh, building structures instead of trying to. Uh, find resources, the um, trying to capture mobs or hide from skeletons rather than obtain resources. Um, again, the, the interacting and stuff was all about how humans and AIs can interact within the space. Um, dynamic and open again is about the sort of open, the the fact that you've got this procedural content generation and the fact that the world is very large that you can find all these different goals and particularly um, and this sort of again touches on this sort of. Uh, human AI interaction loop about people are setting their own goals rather than it be defined by the game, right? So for Montezuma's Revenge, there is a clear goal. You're supposed to complete the game. There's a, a counter in the top right hand uh, that tells you how well you're doing, right? Uh, and there's a definite end to it. With Minecraft, that's not the case. People make up their own games, their own objectives. And if we want an AI to act in that space and interact with a human, they need to be able to autonomously recognize what the human's trying to do. Um, task relevant regularities at multiple time scales. So again, this is that um, if you're going to obtain a diamond, there are various other things that you have to obtain, but they're on a much, so there's, that, that happens on a short term scale of, I need to collect the wood that's immediately in front of me to craft uh, something that allows me to then uh, to collect something else. So you have this regularity of um, how you do things in the environment of like obtaining resources and then going and crafting with them. Um, but they happen at different time scales because certain things require multiple steps to happen beforehand. Um, they there might be multiple uh, resource collections before a craft can happen, or it might be the case that you can just collect a single word and create something from that. Um, other agents impacting performance. I think we touched on a lot about having the the different agents within the space. And then to around sort of complexity of the, the tasks. And again, this comes back to like moving away from these older games. The fact that we're now in a fully embed, embodied within a 3D environment that has a rich number of interactions. It's this open ended space where uh, people have shown rich, diverse behaviors like people in, create entire computers in Minecraft out of Redstone, right? That's not something that you can do within the scope of an Atari game or something that's more fixed. Like this isn't to dismiss that work like the Atari game served a great purpose within the RL community um, but it's about opening up that possibility space and providing uh, a platform that's more open-ended to explore uh, different divergent behaviors that could emerge from these agents acting in a larger space um, and then the last two that are on to, just onto the bottom of the top of the second page there um, we talk about the computational resources of the agent, so they, they do uh, partially observe the, the environment. So it's not a fully observed environment like uh, a lot of classic RL problems would be. You are getting this first person perspective which limits what they can see to a more realistic um, input space. Um, is, is this related because you know you were talking about some of the different strategies and you said when you you know model the agents individually you have this non-stationary uh, problem and then there's the joint action learning and the centralized critic is that yeah. is that related to that or is this just talking about in general yeah so uh, uh, the centralized critic it, it's exactly one of the sort of critiques of the centralized critic approach right so centralized critic it, if you want to really sort of learn a decentralized policy um then people would argue that you need to learn that entirely individually, right? Whereas a centralized critic assumes that we can pull all of those experiences uh, together. At the moment, it's a very practical change to make because it allows us to, to achieve things in multi-agent environments that we wouldn't necessarily be able to without make, weakening that assumption that we can't centralize the view of all of the agents. Um, so it's a nice practical step to, to being able to, for, for something that we can act on right now. But the, the open question is more about sort of given if everybody's decentralized, how can we uh, then act in that completely decentralized space if we've only got our partial observability? And then again, there's some interesting work there, both uh, classically before the uh, 
looking longer term back on multi-agent learning and more recently in the deep RL community. The lab has a long history of working with uh, Xbox and seeing things go in. So um, it's a large focus for MSR Cambridge is this game intelligence theme and the opportunity space that could be realized in partnership with, with the gaming org. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose gaming is becoming ubiquitous now because it's not necessarily something that just happens on an Xbox. I mean, gaming is something that people do on, on all of their devices. And this is presumably ha having some kind of intelligence to, to that gaming layer is something which could really, really be useful. And, and that's the exciting possibility space, right, that's not explored just by looking at superhuman AIs that beat humans, right? Uh, playing against an AI that's superhuman is fun maybe once if you're good at something. Uh, and then you realize that it beats you and and getting beaten repeatedly by it isn't necessarily the most fun experience. And that, that's where things like the empowerment idea that we touched on earlier is really interesting, right? So maybe the thing that an, an agent in this space should do is not solve the problem for you or beat you at the game. It's that it should put you in a place where you can achieve more in the game. Um, and so this could perform something like a, a sort of tutorial aspect or something where it's helping the human get into situations where they can experience new things, right? So rather than you have that point when you're stuck in a game and you don't know what, which way to go forwards and so you quit, quit the game, maybe having an, a companion AI in there that's always working to try and provide you with new experiences, direct you into spaces where you can continue to enjoy the game, maybe that's the, the better interaction. And again, that's where I find it's really sort of unique space of uh, the, the papers that we touched on earlier around sort of like the design experimentation about how do people want to interact with these agents um, rather than just beat the human. Yeah, indeed. And, and as you say, the, the character of gaming is changing as well, because I, I know the Xbox team are doing loads of stuff around, you know, safety online and and um, e even just un understanding the way that people interact with these environments is something which could be a kind of, you know, um, an agent problem as well. And, and uh, increasing people's enjoyment of, of gaming is something that, that we could look at. So there's all sorts of interesting things there. Yeah. Um, any other questions on the call? Okay, well, Sam, thank you so much. It's been absolutely amazing. And um, on Monday, we have a call which is all about UMAP with Mahela Kermai. And um, UMAP, if you if you folks have heard of TUSNI, which is a kind of um, a, a data visualization dimensionality reduction technique, UMAP is is really, really good. It's got some computational um, advance, uh, advantages. It's much quicker. And also um, the, the projected space, um, the, the, the global distances are relevant in TUSNI, only the, the local distances are relevant and you can produce some amazing results. And and uh, Mahela is going to talk through the entire architecture from end to end and talk about some, uh, you know, some some topological um, uh, uh, sort of uh, data analysis theory and nerve theorem. And she'll, she'll just get increasingly more technical as the talk goes on. So um, really, really excited about that. I hope to see you folks on Monday. And um, in the meantime, have a great weekend. And Jim, yes, one quick question. I see you also have a call 20 scheduled for tomorrow at noon. Is that changed? Well, I'm I'm a little bit unsure about that call because uh, Corby has pulled out because he says he's got a doctor's appointment. I'm I'm trying to get someone on his team to fill in and do that, which is why I'm I'm assuming that I'm going to have to pull the plug on on that call. Um, that that's the one about the um uh, the, the 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 intent um uh, classification yeah. on. Yeah, so um, I have a feeling I might have to pull the plug on that, but I'll hopefully know within the next hour or so. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mario. Um, see, see you next week, folks.